Please take your Bibles this morning and turn to Psalm 139, the 139th Psalm. Please find that in your Bibles and in whatever way you have God's Word with you today, find Psalm 139. And we're going to be sharing uh, this Psalm this morning in just a moment. Just want to give you a chance to find that. Psalm 139. I love the book of Psalms as we think about worship the way that God has laid it out for us, the model of worship that we have in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Also, the great songs of worship that we have in the Psalms. And Psalm 139 is just a, a beautiful example of, of what this book is all about. So I'll give you just a moment to find Psalm 139. I want you to notice the uh, title of the message this morning, Search Me, O God. Really, it's the title for Psalm 139, but I do want it also to be the theme of these Sundays that we're going to experience together leading up to Easter. For thousands of years, there has been a tradition with God's people to use the Sundays before Easter as a fresh opportunity just to place our lives before God and to be honest and open and transparent about our lives before our Heavenly Father. All of us can experience those times when we feel like we need to get back to God, we need to get closer to him once again. And we also realize that there have been things that have happened in our lives, maybe even decisions that we have made. And we want to come back to the Lord and say, Lord, take me back in a fresh way. I want to come back and be recommitted to you once again. But then also this morning, if, you, if you're here in worship with us today or if you're listening to our services, and if you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, Psalm 139 is a beautiful gateway into that because it tells us who God is and how we can even be confronted with this amazing truth about him, but then how Jesus Christ bridges that gap between us and our God. Psalm 139, let's look at it together. Please stand in honor of God's word. Follow along in your Bibles as I read aloud, and then keep your Bibles open to Psalm 139 during the message today. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I could count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Psalm 139 tells us 
some amazing truths about God. Psalm 139 tells us some things about God's character, about who he is and what he does. And, and part of worship when we gather together as God's people is we want to lift up the Lord and praise him for his character, who he is and what he does, and even the things that God alone can do. But there is an amazing, stark truth that is presented just in the first few verses of Psalm 139 that we must get today and we must understand today. It is truth that is very clearly expressed, but what I'm saying to you is this is truth that can make us uncomfortable. It's truth that you and I can still grapple with. And I would even say this to you, if you could know exactly what Psalm 139 is affirming, and walk away not being affected by it, then I would say that you have not heard the word of God today. Again, notice what Psalm 139 tells you about God. First couple of verses. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. We often talk of God as being the sovereign Lord, the sovereign creator the creator of the universe, the one who holds the universe together, the, the God of the cosmos, the God of history, the God of the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. It is right and good to praise God for, for how immense he is and how awesome he is. And God is all of those things. The word of God affirms it. But Psalm 139 tells us something also about God. Not only is he the big God, the immense God, the amazing God, but he's also the God who knows you, and he knows me. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. He knows you intricately, and he knows you intimately. There is nothing about you that God doesn't no. And Psalm 139 affirms this, and, and I love the way it expresses it. The psalmist simply says, God, you've searched me. You, you, you know everything about me. And, and even though the psalmist didn't know anything about DNA and chromosomes, you and I do today, and we can even say this, God knows you down to the chromosome. God knows you down to the last gene in your DNA. He knows you that thoroughly and that closely and that intimately. In fact, God knows you better than you know yourself. For example, how many of you, without looking at your fitness tracker, that's not fair, how many of you could tell me how many times you have gotten up and sat down this morning without looking at your device? How many of y'all could tell me that? Okay, I, don't, I, don't, I have no idea. How many times have I gotten up and sat down? I have no idea. But the Bible says God knows. God knows when you get up. God knows when you sit down. God knows every single step that you take. He knows you that well. Jesus said that he's even got the number of hairs on your head numbered. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I'm kind of simple, but I believe that's literally true. That's how deeply and intimately and singularly God knows every one of us. He even knows your thoughts. He knows what you and I are thinking. And even if we never give expression to what we're thinking, and even if we never even use a word so that maybe no one else knows what it is, God knows it. Even from afar, he knows everything about us. He knows our actions. He knows the good we do. He knows the bad that we do. He knows the good that we intend to do. He knows the bad that we avoided doing. He knows everything, everything. And if you say, Pastor Mike, I'm sorry, but that just strains believability. I, I, I just can't fathom how God could know me that perfectly and that intimately. And again, this is God. This is who God is, the immense, amazing, sovereign creator, but also the God who knows you and I down to the DNA and down to the chromosome. It is just a fact. And what I'm saying to you is that the Bible didn't say it, if the Bible didn't affirm it so clearly, I'm not sure that I would believe it. 
How would it be possible for God to be that intimately aware and intimately knowledgeable of every single person alive right now? How could that possibly work? How could that possibly be true? The Bible says that that's who God is, and that's how deeply he knows us. Now, here's what I want you to see about Psalm 139. Here's the truth. God knows us intimately, and God knows us completely. I want you to get that, and I want you to understand that today, because that is just simply truth, okay? Now, the question is, how do you and I respond to that truth knowing this and having the Bible tell us this so clearly and so plainly, then what do we do as a result? Because you can't know this and see this and simply be ambivalent about it. Well, okay, God knows me intimately and completely. Now on to the next thing. If that's your response, you haven't heard it. How do we respond? Because he knows everything. Thoughts, actions, desires, intent, everything, past, present, and future. How do we respond? And Psalm 139 actually lines out for us the four responses that you and I tend to have to this fact and this amazing thing about God. And that's what I want to show you here in Psalm 139 because here's one response that you and I have. Knowing that God knows us this deeply and intimately and completely, one response, one response is we can run. We can run. Notice how the psalmist describes this for us. A look at Psalm 139, verse 3. He says, you search out my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word's on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Look at verse 5. Here, here's, here's the claustrophobia coming in here, verse 5. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high and I cannot attain it. In other words, it's blowing my mind, Lord, that you know me this well. Better than anybody else, better than even I know myself. But isn't it true, knowing that God knows us this completely, one response is to run. Look at verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit if I or where shall I flee from your presence? And then look at verse 8, because he actually describes what it means to go up as high as you can go, and then to go as low as you can go, and then to go as far to the right and as far to the left as it is human possibly to run. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? Verse 8, if I ascend to heaven, if I go up as far as I can go, you're there. But then he says, if I make my bed in Sheol, Sheol was the grave for the Old Testament. This was where people were who, who dwelt among the dead. This was thought to be the place where you could go to be as far away from God as possible. But the psalmist tells us something. He says, you know what? If, if, if I go where things are dead, where things are lifeless, and if I think that if I go to the very place where you won't be, not only do you chase me, but you're already there. You're in heaven, you're in Sheol. He says, if, if I go to the dawn, if I go as far east as I can go, you're already there. If I go to the sea, the, the word for sea also means west. If I go to the west, you're already there. Not only is God all-knowing, he's also all-present. You can't run from him. We still try, but we can't. The knowledge that God knows us this well, it begins to hem us in, and we think we can run from God. In fact, for folks even here this morning, you, you, you're in church, but you're still running from God because you think you can. But you and I both know you can't. One response is to run. I want you to notice another response uh, that we might try to hide. Some try to run, but then also some try to hide, right? Notice how the psalmist describes this for us. He says in verse uh, 11, he says, if I say, surely the, the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. Night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Here the response is, God knows me this well. Well, maybe I can find a place where I can hide from him. If I can hide from, 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 from my Christian friends, if I can hide from the people who are most concerned about me, if I can just get off to, to where no one else will know where I am, to hide. But we can't. In fact, the psalmist reminds us in verse 13, you formed me in my inward parts. You needed me together in my mother's womb. 
It goes on to say in verse 15, My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. The moment you were conceived in your mother's womb, no, uh, no ultrasound revealed that you were there. Maybe your mom and your dad, maybe your parents didn't even know that you were there. You didn't even know that it had happened, but God knew. He sees you, and even he's knitting and, and weaving you together in that secret place. No one else even knows it's happened, but God does. In other words, there's nowhere to hide from him, no way to run, nowhere to hide. But then I want, you to, I want to show you a third response. Because again, this can get very uncomfortable knowing that God sees everything, God knows everything about us. We can't run, we can't hide, and yet here is something else that we so often do. Sometimes we point fingers. We get uncomfortable you're hemming me in, God. You're, you're, you're bringing up to my mind and my heart, and you're convicting me about, about certain parts of my life. And, and, Lord, it's getting so uncomfortable. I can't run from you. I can't hide from you. But, you know, there's something else I can at least try, and that is to point fingers at other people. God, I want to get your gaze off of me for a while. Because have you noticed what those other people are doing? See how the psalmist describes this. And, and, and to me, it makes sense about some of these verses because at first they seem so out of character here. Look at verse 19 of, of Psalm 139. The psalmist says in verse 19, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Strong language. Where does it come from? Why is it here in Psalm 139? I think it's the psalmist's way of helping us understand as God's people so often. When the gaze of the Lord gets to be too uncomfortable, and again, when we're convicted about some things in our lives that God is not pleased with, that are even breaking the heart of God, one response is, God, have you seen what they're doing? Have you, have you noticed their lifestyle and that choice and what they're mixed up into and what they're into and all the things that they are doing? Lord, have you noticed that lately? What are we doing? God, just, just get your gaze off of me for a while, and I'll point fingers at somebody else. This is the response of legalism. It's the response of judgmentalism, having a critical spirit, and it's so easy for us to slip into that rut, and that's why Jesus was so clear and dogmatic about this with the Pharisees of his day, because that's what the Pharisees would do. They would point up all the evil in other people's lives, and Jesus says to them, look, what about you? What about your heart? What about what's on the inside of you? Psalm 139. We can run, we can hide, we can even try to point fingers. But there's a fourth response here that is really the only good response, the only right response with this knowledge and conviction that God sees you, he knows everything about you, there is really only one response. And that is to submit. To say, God, you win. You win, right? That, that, that's Jacob wrestling with the angel in the book of Genesis. God, you win. I can't run. I can't hide. Pointing fingers doesn't work. So, God, you win. I will trust you. And I will give my life to you. And notice how this change happens by the end of the psalm. In verse 22, he's still trying to point fingers. It's not working. And then look at verse 23. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Notice what he's doing. He is no longer trying to put the focus on anybody else. He's saying, Lord, what about me? And the realization is, God already knows. How many times do we find ourselves saying, you know, I, I pray to God about something, but he already knows about it. Of course he already knows about it. But notice what the psalmist does in Psalm 139. He says, God, you already know these things. 
But I want to say to you, God, I want to partner with you. I want to join you. And as long as you already know it, God, then help me see it. Help me know it, God, and help me change. Lord, show me what you see. Reveal to me what you are discerning. Because, God, I want to be close to you, and I want to live a life that honors you, and I want to show you how much I love you and how much I trust you. Lord, the things that you see, I want to see too. We're not running, we're not hiding, and we're not trying to put the blame on anybody else. We've got the courage We've got the trust and the faith that says, God, it's just me and you and the searching light of your spirit. Uh, look at verses 23 and 24 carefully because they're very important. And this is where I want all of us to be, to be able to be this honest and this trusting of God. Because in verse 23, the psalmist says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. The word for search, the very same word used in verse 23 as we find in verse 1. It, it, it's the idea of searching something carefully and being able to weigh one against the other, being able to, to uh, uh, take away what doesn't matter and focus on only what is good. It's this Bible word of discernment. Lord, search me. Discern my heart. And then look at the end of verse 23. Try me, test me. It's a bold prayer here. Asking God to test your very thoughts, but then reveal to you what he sees. The point is in verse 24. See if there is any grievous way in me. The ESV says grievous. Uh, your, your Bible translation might say something else there in verse 24, but the word literally means see if there is anything idolatrous in me. And folks, th th this is the basic temptation of our walk with God. Is I, the basic temptation is always idolatry. Always idolatry. When we take something and we make it our God, we take something to where it calls our tune, it directs our paths, we find ourselves trusting is it, in it and not God. Maybe it's addiction to a, a chemical or a behavior. Maybe it's, maybe it's money or sex or power or influence or, or just the opinions that other people have of you or the affirmation, the love that you, the, 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 that you so desperately want and need from others. Whatever it is, you've made it your God. And it's become your idol. How brave, how courageous it is to say, God, if there is idolatry in my heart, Help me see it, help me know it, and help me to be honest with you about it. Do you see how all this works? It's being confronted with this amazing truth. God knows you intimately and completely and simply saying, God, I'm not going to fight that. I am not going to fight it. But instead, I trust you. I trust your love and your wisdom and your compassion. Now, I want you to notice how Jesus makes all of this connect together, okay? Let me show this to you. Keeping your spot there in Psalm 139, I want you to turn in the New Testament to John chapter 1, okay? Psalm 139, keep that, but then turn to John chapter 1. I want to show you something about Jesus. Because Jesus is God. Jesus is God with us, right? And in the, we've got some stories at the beginning of the Gospel of John where Jesus is simply revealing himself as God. And so the attributes that God has, Jesus has. And one of those attributes that we see in John chapter 1 is this intimate and complete knowledge of people. And it's bowling people over. They can't believe it. It, it is rocking their world to realize that this man they are meeting, this man they are conversing with, knows them completely and thoroughly. Let me give you an example. Look at John chapter 1, and I want you to notice what happens at about verse 43, okay? Jesus is about to meet a man named Nathaniel, and Nathaniel has heard some things about Jesus, and he really he's already made up his mind, you know. Jesus comes from Nazareth. Nothing can really come from Nazareth. I, I've, I've really made up my mind about it, and he's not, he doesn't impress me at all. But then Jesus encounters Nathaniel, and notice what Jesus says to Nathanael to where Nathanael is convinced that Jesus is God. Look at verse 43 of John 1. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, 
we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, just, just come and see. Come and encounter this man. Verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. In other words, Nathanael, I know some things about your character. You and I have never met before. We're just meeting for the first time. But Nathaniel, I know your heart. I know your spirit. I know that you want nothing that is that is that is anything to do with guile or deceit. I know this about you, Nathaniel. And so he says in verse 48, How do you know me? How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, listen. Fig trees. Thick leaves. Fig trees were where people hid. If you wanted to be out of sight, if you wanted to be a place where no one else knew where you were, you would go under a fig tree. Where did, um, uh, what, what the, the wee little man, what was his name? Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus. yeah, thank you. What, what tree did Zacchaeus climb up? It was a sycamore fig tree, right? to get a better vantage point of Jesus. He is up in a fig tree. Nathaniel is under a fig tree, but it's a place where you could hide. No one knew he was there. No one knew he was there. Nathaniel was there. Jesus said, Nathaniel, I saw you. I saw you. You were trying to hide. You were trying to escape. You were trying to flee. Nathaniel, I know you, and I saw you. And notice then what Nathanael says. Verse 49, Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now, same thing happens in John chapter 4. Jesus has this conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. She gets convinced that he is the Savior. She goes back into the town of Sychar, and she says, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? In other words, he knows me intimately, and he knows me completely. Listen, let Jesus be your bridge today. You cannot know this about God and leave ambivalent or, or, or just kind of letting it go. Listen, no, G God knows everything about you. But listen, Jesus the Son says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If, if, if this is burdensome to you, the fact that God knows everything about you, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and let him say, I see you, I know you, and I love you. Jesus, God the Son, he gave his life for you. He rose from the grave for you. Even right now, he is at the Father's right hand. There's nothing that Jesus doesn't know. No one knows you more. No one knows you better. And no one loves you more than Jesus. Come to him today. Father, we thank you this morning for Psalm 139 and how Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, helps us to see it fully for what it is. God, thank you that our loving Savior knows exactly what it means to have flesh and blood and bones and blood and, and, and to live through a day and to be buffeted and to be affected by all this world can throw at a person. In fact, we've got God the Son who says, I know what it means to take the very worst the world can do, the very worst the enemy can do. And right now, he lives and he reigns. And by your Holy Spirit, he's saying to each one of us, I see you today. You think you're hiding. You think you've got pretense and all the appearances, but I see who you really are, and I love you, and I want to forgive you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.